Mm. Okay, hello everyone. We are live. So we'll kind of just wait a few seconds for people to start to come in because there is about a minute delay on all of these things. You'll have probably noticed that I am with Steve Maslow, uh, three-time triple Oscar winner, uh, sound re-recording mixer extraordinaire. <laughs> and he's on the line with me right now. So, hi, Steve. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. Nice to uh, be with you. Thank you very much. So this is, uh, for the people that are also a bit confused why I've gone from episode two to episode four, it's because some of these articles are uh, just mm. written interviews for the okay. Hello, everyone. busy, we busy people. Live. And now a strange echo. <laughs> I'm getting okay. yeah, a pretty wicked delay. <laughs> yeah, it's just playing back. Okay, so uh, we'll just kind of get started, and there'll be people just periodically joining us um, on the okay. text chat. So if uh, anyone out there has any questions, just put it in the comments box to the side, and I will kind of feed in periodically um, as it as it kind of makes sense. Um, to I should probably quote some of the. Uh, long, long list of films that Steve has <laughs> done. Uh, so the he's a sound re-recording mixer, and for those who don't know, we'll get onto that in a sec. Uh, most recently, he's uh, doing post-production on Mad Max Fury Road, uh, as well as, um, I mean, the, the list just goes just goes on and on. It's, it's fantastic to have him on. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, did he do all the Star Wars, the original? No, just, just the second one. Well, wow, that is amazing. That's Which what was the Empire do. Strikes Back. Yes, there we go. And most recently yeah. as well, some of the others are Great Gatsby. Uh, there's, yeah, there's so many. It's fantastic. So, Steve, uh, let's just start... Um, start with uh, how it all began. Can you give us a quick a quick overview of how you got in, how you got into uh, re-recording mixing? I started out as a roadie with a uh, group called the Strawberry Alarm Clock back in the late '60s um, as their um, the, uh, touring road manager sound. I, I set up the sound for the uh, gigs, and from that opened up the, um, the the whole music industry for me. I I, uh, I got into from there. I went into mixing records, um, and from from records, uh, I spent two about two to three years mixing records. A couple of my hits were uh, "Oh What a Night" by um, the Four Seasons. And um, Boogie Oogie Oogie by, by Taste of Honey. I, I may be dating myself, but th those it was just coming right out of the uh, the disco era. And uh, then the, the, the film, the, as the music industry started to uh, burn down, so to speak, um, a lot of people were doing uh, garage band stuff, and uh, they weren't going into the studio as much. And so I looked around and saw an opportunity to get into... Um, Film mixing, and uh, within a year, I got my first Academy Award for um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Or, and then the year after that was Empire Strikes Back. I may have that flipped. It's kind of weird to say that. I don't know which one was first because I can't remember. <laughs> I think it, then, I think it was uh, the the Empire Strikes Back, according to the old. I'm that's the right. It was. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> fantastic. <laughs> and, um, the rest is history. Just from there, I think yes. I've got over 200 films now. Yes. No. It's it's phenomenal. It's and just to have that. Yeah. What did it feel like, for instance, just to go kind of straight into kind of film mixing, and then I mean, did you, for instance, find it similar to music, or how did how did that kind of come well, about? Um, with music mixing, it. Music mixing was a lot more um, 
uh, the smaller increments on the faders. Uh, you, you just did little, you know, when you wanted the guitar or the voice a, a little bit louder, it was just an incremental push. So when it came to fill mixing, those incremental pushes didn't work as well because, like, when you went when, when you were mixing music against a scene and the scene cut to another scene, it wasn't an incremental push. It was a pretty broad stroke because you wanted to hit the cut. So it it took me a little time to get used to those big broad moves in terms of making the music work because I started out in film as a music mixer. So that was that was my forte. So it was not only the audio portion, but I also had to look at the screen and, and, and make the film work. So it was like two dimensions for me. And then eventually um, I moved into the dialogue position and that's what I do now, dialogue and music. Fantastic, fantastic. And for those that are not aware, uh, so a re-recording mixer is doing the, the final stages and all of the final uh, mix. Is that that's correct? In terms of correct, the yes. dialogue. I, I get, right, I, I get um, individual tracks and units. For example, on, on um, dialogue, I might get 16 to 32 different tracks of dialogue. And I'll, in, in the first portion of film mixing, I'll take those 16 to 32 tracks and mix them down to a workable pre-dub. So I'm not, um, I'm not chasing different levels uh, during the final. So th there's two stages. There's pre-dubbing and then there's final. And I'm taking all those units and, and making them into a workable uh, pre-dub or a pre-mixed track that I can then... A play against uh, music and, and sound effects and make the film work. Fantastic. So when, for instance, when I've been doing uh, post-production films, it's there's a lot of kind of pre-mixing as as you go along, especially in kind of the um, yeah the low-budget kind of indie realm. You're always trying to keep on top of yeah keeping everything uh, with one solid kind of path all the way through. So in Correct. terms of when when things arrive to you, um, that the how what is your process for um, kind of getting a hold of those sixteen tracks and kind of leveling them up? Well, if uh, if the tracks are relatively clean, and what I mean by clean, the backgrounds aren't horrendous against the dialogue, because if I have a lot of noise against the dialogue. I have to be real careful because you don't want to, every time you cut to a different character or to a different track, you don't want to hear the dial, the backgrounds jump in level. So if, the, if it's really noisy, I'm more concerned with background jumping. Um, if it's really noisy, then I, I actually try to get them looped so, you know, or re-recorded uh, in a loop stage. I don't do looping, so I'll have the actors, I'll try to get the actors to re-perform their production tracks so that I can at least control the level of dialogue against the rest of the film. So if the dialogue is in pretty good shape, then what I try to do is just make sure that I can hear the dialogue between characters and that uh, as you cut between scenes or within the uh, in the actor in the scene within the actor, sometimes the setup could be an hour or two. So uh, things change. The position of the mic may be different. I don't particularly care for body mics. Uh, they're really difficult to get space. <clears throat> so I'm, what I'm trying to do is just level out the dialogue within the scene so that it sounds like. If it's a three-minute scene, that whole three minutes sound like it was done in one take. So that, that's what I'm trying to do. Make you know, level it out. Uh, S, S's uh, are a real problem now with uh, digital recording. So uh, I'm I'm very concerned about, and I try to minimize all those S's and and because uh, it just it just doesn't pleasant to the ear. So those are my first uh, concerns when I first start with dialogue. Right, that's really yeah, that's really interesting because especially in terms of the uh, DSing and things like that, when does because the final stage is obviously as well the uh, where you start adding the effects and well the uh, kind of final EQ and things like that is that kind of 
uh, a work in progress as well? Yes. I, um, what I try to do is, like I say, get the dialogue leveled out, and then um, with EQ, mild compression, some DSing, and maybe a slight skimming to get the noise reduction down. So I'll just get some of that. You don't need that. 60 cycle and below roar, so I'll try to minimize that. So, uh, so that could take me on a six, I'm not sure if you guys call them spools or reels, but on a six reel film, um, I'll, I'll, I'll prep that dialogue so it's, it's, it's pre-compressed, pre-EQ'd, so that when I get ready for my final, I just put everything up to the zero level. And then I may, I may, depending on what the music is doing and what effects are doing, I may have to add a little, just a slight more top end or push the level to, to get above the, uh, the, the, the sound effects. I typically find that after I've pre-dubbed a film that I'm actually pushing my, my pre-mix about a dB and a half so it sits right in the pocket. There's, you know, there's, a, there's a sound reference in your head that you get used to. Nice. Because the um, it's interesting as well because obviously you, you, we have also the dialogue editors and the sound effects editors, and they're they're predominantly giving you obviously all the all the components of everything, and they they must be doing um, some sort of light premixing as well. Is there are you throughout that that process as well, or when are you kind of when are you uh, joining to be able to kind of uh, sort of take the baton, as it were. Okay. In, in the, obviously, the editors have worked beforehand supplying me with tracks, and a lot of editors will put their volume graphs in there. Not, so, not, not necessarily equalization or compression. Usually, it's, it's, it's volume. And what I'll ask them is, um, before I start, sometimes I'll say, do I, do I need this volume graph in the, in the tracks? And if they suggest that I stay with it, then I'll work with it. Otherwise, sometimes they say, no, you can get rid of it because I was just trying to work things out. But if you think you can do a better job, but I'll listen to what they've done. I'll never disrespect their work, of course. And um, go, f you know, so what, they, what they've done for two weeks on a reel or however long it's taken them, I don't want to just say, heck with it, I'll do it myself. Because I've seen people, I've seen mixers throw stuff out and they're just, they just dig it themselves into a huge hole, especially with music. Oh, my God, where the music editor has pre-mixed or pre-leveled a lot of the components in the, in the track, and then the, 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 the music mixer will think, I can do a better job than that, and throws it away. And now, you're, now he start, he's just thrown away a week's or two weeks' worth of work, and he's struggling through the mix, and the director's sitting there wondering, the hell's taking so long? It's I just don't like to do that, so I always ask before I even you know proceed just to make sure that what they've done uh, uh, is what they're actually giving the director to re what he remembers because if that's some, if you throw that away you you really uh, uh, increase the chance of you know coming in the next day <laughs> to work. <laughs> <laughs> But well, that's it's a really it's a really interesting kind of thing all the way through the whole sound kind of process. Because me, for instance, being a, a sound mixer, you do your own rough mix of uh, obviously the dialogue predominantly, mm -hmm. um, and then that goes to the the dialogue editor, and then the dialogue editor is going to go, okay, I kind of see what you're doing here. Now I'm going to try and do this, and then it it comes and it's kind of again it's an it's another evolution of that. So are you talking with the uh, director in kind of pre-production for your stage of things quite intensely or are you kind of following along from when the whole team in terms of the post-production is, is sort of brought on board? Well, what helps me is if I'm involved on the very first temp mix because the director of course, will be there with the picture editor and all your support editors. So if you're going through a sequence and you only have four days to make a temp mix, and the director says, don't, don't worry about the dialogue here that's all music or that's a big gunshot. I want to hear all the rockets and car things and 
you know, it's just grunts and, you know, from the dialogue, you get a sense of what his template's going to be like. That uh, that's very helpful for me, so that I can I can know how much I need to or not need to work on any particular dialogue sequence. When I know that it, this particular dialogue sequence is going to have rip roaring music and a, a gunfight through it, so I can actually instead of going through each track of dialogue and getting out the wines and making sure it's perfect because I know what's going to be laying on top of it, I can actually go through much quicker. So, and I don't get the director um, pre-dubs. Typically what I'll, I, I like to do if the director is available, I'll pre-dub a reel and then I like to call him in and say, listen to this, see what you think. And he's not, some directors will do that, some won't, it's just, they, oh, I can't make any judgments, he'll say, because I need to hear the dialogue, I need to hear effects and music. And some, some directors will say, yeah, let me hear it and play it for me, because uh, occasionally an editor will pick a different performance on a dialogue track uh, that's much cleaner, but it's like changing the lyrics of your favorite song, and he'll say, is that, do we... Do we use that? Is that? He'll turn to me or the editor and say, is that the right track? Uh, and then the editor will say, uh, it's a cleaner version. We have the old version. And then I can, so if I'm doing that kind of stop and start during, a, during the first reel with dialogue, um, it makes the, the final much smoother. He's not, he's not, excuse me, picking flesh it out of pepper, if I can use that terminology. Uh, he's just look. He's he now is an audience instead of uh, you know going for the minutia. Is that the right? Is that the right? You know, once you do that, I, I kind of you kind of lose them a little bit. So it's, for me, it's it, it helps to have the the director come in and listen to a dialogue reel that I prepped. And if he likes it, then I know I'm that much ahead, especially on the final. Fantastic. And in terms of um, just speaking from kind of my own experience, when we've uh, like presented stuff to uh, directors and things in terms of like again those cleaner cleaner tracks. Uh, we we've generally done I think about I mean kind of no more than kind of three. You kind of have the original, you have the really clean one, and then you potentially have another one that maybe you think that might be kind of nice for the kind of performance. So are you in terms of uh, kind of number of alts and kind of working with that that dialogue editor. Are you just kind of there with them, and then they're kind of explaining to you what their choices were, or are you ever asking for um, kind of another another alternate? Yeah, uh, when, what I get presented, I I don't know the history. All I all I see is I open a track up, and that's what it is. But if it if if it's indicated that it's an alt track, I always want to put that alt as a as an alternate where you don't hear it. Um, so I'll premix it in a way that's it's not audible, but use the original take because I know the director has been listening to his track for 18 months. And so if he hears if he hears the performance difference, he's he's gonna react. If it's if it's really, really close, or if the editor said I've I run it by the director. He he likes this take. Then I'll put that in. But typically, I like to go with with the track that you know the production track, not the alt. But I'll have the alt ready. And then you know with Pro Tools, I I can have the rigs always next to me with the editor. And if the director says, "What does the alt sound like?" And then I'll just have him switch it real quick, and I'm good to go. Nice. But typically, I like to I like to put the production the, the take that he remembers, even though it might have a, a a car squeak or you know some kind of clunk over it. Uh, I, it. It's it's all about the performance, and if he likes the performance, I'm good with it. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, in terms of uh, these, the, the kind of notes that you're getting, are you are you getting a complete report, or are you kind of then having again a, a pre-production meeting for at the temp mix, and you're making your own notes? I mean, how do you keep track of what everyone else is kind of doing, especially on the films where uh, there's multiple dialogue editors and the multiple re-recording mixes and the multiple uh, of everyone? 
I don't run into. Uh, I, I'm not privy to some of these pre-production meetings. Typically, um, it's been typically I'll finish a film, and then the next day or the next week uh, I'll start another film. And it's either either you start with a everybody's in the room, you're trying to set the console up, and it's a five-day temp mix. And so that, that that's when I, those temp mixes are really helpful for me. I can I can hear how bad the tracks are and what ADR they're going to possibly use. But um, as far as being in on mixes or a pre, you know uh, meetings beforehand, I'm never I've never been on one of those ever. So it's it, it's just not a luxury I I am invited to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that because the editor is somewhere else and he may when he comes in he'll tell me boy these tracks are noisy but this is what it is and so um, we're, we're going to get some loops later a lot of times I get the loops almost a, a day before we start final and I, I gotta quickly drop them in and it's you know if the performance isn't perfect it's always ooh, you know, it, it sticks out <laughs> I hate that so I prefer to go with production rather than have a, a, a badly performed loop because it just I, I, I just don't like to hear all of a sudden, what was that? You know, where uh, the, the loop is so different from the production. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of the, um, so the bigger films, uh, one of the ones that sticks out to me is the the, uh, the Great Gatsby and things like that. Ah. And they have the most elaborate, elaborate kind of sets and things like that. Is that, I mean, I don't know if you can like recall specifically the the production tracks versus uh, what needed to be looped and things because there's obviously a lot of uh, stuff all over the place with uh, cars and then just the background is very it's it's, it's a very that... no yeah <laughs> sorry I was gonna say it's interesting that you 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 picked on the Gatsby because when I started doing the Great Gatsby predubs um I. I I did that in Australia, and I hadn't worked with these people before, and they cut mod to mod on the production tracks, and I'm like, oh my god! And for those who don't know what mod to mod is, it was just once the dialogue starts and it stops, there was not, there was no fill in between. Problem was that Baz, the director, talked over everything, and uh, in fact, it drove Leonardo crazy because he would. He would direct Leonardo. Okay, move in closer. That's it. Come out. Yeah, come down a little. And it just so he talked over everything. And so they had a cut mod to mod. It was just crazy. The dialogue was not in too bad of a shape, but the the sound supervisor decided that he needed we needed to loop this. And I'm telling you, um, it's the biggest. One of the biggest films I've ever worked on. That probably had almost 5,000 loops in it. Um, if you saw the film, that 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 the, there were there were reels, you know, uh, 20 minutes reels with maybe um, three or four production lines. The rest was all looped, like that that stuff in the uh, the, the hotel where they're having where they're chipping the ice. That's all loops. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, and you can you can you can kind of tell, especially with the with the look of the film as well. There's just something that's not quite. I don't know for me that was quite sitting all the way through. It was. I mean, it was. You could obviously watch, and it was it was making sense and stuff. But just from that technical kind of background, I thought it was actually very interesting, with all the kind of disjointedness, um, to also just have that ADR. But once you have so much ADR, I mean, is it it's not necessarily better, but it's obviously a lot smoother than doing. Is it smoother than doing kind of one line? I don't know. There's probably not a not a boundary. Well, it's, it's a different kind of a. It's a different problem because the loops are all close. You know, pretty much tight mic. So when you have people, uh, it you, you try to tr introduce some kind of spatial quality to the dialogue so it doesn't feel like a loop scene. So. Uh, each for me, each line I had to put a small amount of room to it, and then once each each line had had its process, then the whole scene had its process. So I, I had multiple layers of processing on on reels just to try to fit it in and to make it sound like it was production rather than looped. Yeah, it sounds like a real job. 
<laughs> and uh, for ah, what was I going to say? The um, so you're you're predominantly focusing on the on just the and the dialogue and for the people that uh, inevitably going to ask about the the levels. What kind of levels are you roughly aiming for? In, in, do you have a? Is it all kind of how it sounds, or are you kind of hitting some kind of rough areas? Just like when you record, for instance, everyone's saying like between minus twenty and minus twelve, uh, depending how loud it is and things like that. Are you? Well, once, once the room is set up, um, there's a level that I, you know, after so many films, I just know where the dial. I don't chase um, meter. I, I, it's all a question about where that dialogue is sitting in res, in relationship to the screen and where I'm sitting behind the, the, the console. So there's a there's a a level that I that I'm used to, um, and and that's that's what I shoot for. It's it, it's a I can't say oh it's a 88 SPL. I, I just don't know what it is. It's just what it what what I have in in my head that. Um, has a natural dialogue feel. Now there's some ed, some dialogue guys I've been in their rooms when they're mixing, and that dialogue is just ripping your head off that, uh, for whatever reason. But uh, and I find, you know, so most most my criticism on dialogue is it's too loud. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And in in terms of the, uh, so how how are you keeping the kind of dynamic range of everything when you're so you have the, the really quiet scenes the really loud scenes are you doing things independently of each other or are you just constantly trying from every kind of scene where it's appropriate trying to kind of change the kind of feel of it well I do I, I do chase dialogue so um, once I pre dub the dialogue it sounds pretty good then you put your air and your cars and your music behind it. Now the dialogue starts to fall back screen, so uh, I'll start to chase it. So I like to, it. It sits in the pocket, if whatever pocket that is. So, so, yes, I do chase it. I'm I'm very concerned about hearing um, every every if the actor's speaking. I want you to be able to hear every word. You know. Um, as opposed to, I know, I know there's a huge criticism on Interstellar because. Uh, Chris Nolan went for a different way of presenting dialogue, and you know sometimes when you're in a in a car and you got the windows down and you got the radio turned up and you're talking to the guy next to you, he might not hear you, and, and that's the way uh, Chris wanted to present his dialogue. And so, but but people in the audience were losing it because they couldn't hear all the dialogue, and you know his. The, it's it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting format. Um, but my take is, if, if the actor is speaking, I want to hear everything. I don't know. If, did you see uh, Inter Inter Did you see it, it, Chris the Interstellar? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, and then talking to uh, Mark uh, as well, the the production mixer. It was very, it was very interesting how his take on set was. Was he always? Uh, needed to see the boom. He always wanted to uh, make sure he was getting stuff for sound. Uh, personally, when I was watching the film, for um, the kind of I can I can see the yeah the mix being an issue definitely for some people. I could hear I think ninety nine point nine percent. I was expecting <laughs> it from kind of the the uh, the things that were going online to like not be able to hear anything <laughs> from right. what people were kind of saying. It was just like, oh my god, it's terrible. But I think it was really interesting to kind of take it, kind of what uh, like use it in a way where it's it's actually, uh, I guess, not doing the job, but it's it's a more artistic approach, let's say, than yeah. like a, a technical approach. Uh -huh. So I, I thought that was actually. Yeah, you can kind of see what he's doing, but then sometimes, yes, when you do miss miss the kind of the the odd line or something, you're like, was that Im important? What? <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, at, at first, the audience doesn't know, but I, 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 you know, it's 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 an interesting. I, it's just an interesting way of approaching film mixing. 
I personally like to hear everything, but uh, you know, it, it's a it's a, a one of his other films, you know, The Dark Knight. There was a lot of problems with uh, the whole mask thing. People couldn't yeah. understand it at all, you know. <laughs> so. yeah. And have you done? I mean, throughout your your range of films, there's there's uh, I mean, like a common thing for me, for instance, is uh, and a few other questions that I usually get is what what do you on on location you're trying to get the actors to speak obviously as intelligibly as kind of possible obviously otherwise right. you have to, you have to completely ADR them but are you are you finding that people are doing that there seems to be a kind of trend of people getting really kind of gritty and and low and kind of quiet uh, and kind of I don't know I just I just seem uh, slightly more intelligibility, un unintelligibility, I guess, in the actual voices of people like I'll, roughly. I'll chase, those, I'll chase those levels so that you can hear it. And, yeah. You know, and a lot of times um, with with Pro Tools, you know, I can get in there and, and volume graph the and it and just small little S's and you know, it's, I really, I really go to a lot of trouble to get intelligibility on every word. So mm -hmm. if the actor drops off stuff, if he's talking like that, I'll 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 sculpt it up so I can hear everything. Uh, uh, sometimes the problem is that I I can't do too much to it because I'm bringing up a lot of background noise, and so it's it's hard to do that. Like on um, the town, I don't know if you saw the Ben Affleck film, The Town. Mm -hmm. There were some there were some scenes in the car where he's talking to the act, or Ben's talking to, I forget her name, but he was t talking very low, and I wanted to hear what he was saying, and I could only go so high, and then when Ben, when I played the reel back for Ben, Ben thought he could, he, he said, can you just push those lines up, I can't hear them, I said, they're as high as I can get them without inducing noise, he said, that's okay, okay, fine, I just want to let him know, so I pushed those lines up, and you can hear the shh, Coming up as as I'm raising the dialogue, it was you know, <laughs> tough, tough. Yes, it's difficult, but there's a trade-off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. And in terms of, uh, so you are just focusing on on dialogue. Are you also doing uh, effects as well, or are you generally just focused on the dialogue kind of dubbing part? I do dialogue and music, so the, the way I, we approach it, or I like to approach it, is I'll put the dialogue I'll, as for a final take or a first pass. I'll put the dialogue down against the sound effects, no music. So, uh, so we we get the we, we get the grit going and the the actual feel of the film with dialogue and effects. Okay, and then. Once once we're comfortable, that could take a couple of three or four hours, depending on the complexity of the of that particular reel. Once once we're cover, comfortable with, uh, I'll hear all the words, uh, gunshots and cars are working fine and there's air going good. Then I'll go back to the top and start putting the music in. Now that's not a hard and fast rule because sometimes the music is really complicated. So what we'll do is we'll do a scene with dialogue and effects, go back and put the music in. So that the effects guy can figure out what he's got to push or pull to get around the music. Uh, and then there are times when, I, well, I'll just put the music in at a really comfortable lower level from top, from pop to pop, while I'm putting down the dialogue and effects, um, so that the, the effects uh, the effects mixer can get a handle on what's going on musically. And then I'll just sit back and let him work his. Uh, his sound effects. Once he's comfortable with that, then I'll go back and do the dialogue, put that in the right place, then do a final music pass, which could take two days. The whole, you know, it all in. Yeah, incredibly efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Just me, me looking yeah. like, wow, that's yeah, two days, amazing. Um, well, uh, the Gatsby took us. We we spent five days of reel on a Gatsby. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Good old Gatsby. Yeah. The, um, um, so there's there's a bit of back and forth between you and the and the sound effects mixer as well. Um, Correct. 
is that again with the director sitting in and are you sitting in on his kind of mixes or are you just happy to kind of okay he's done okay he's done that so now I'm I'm just going to fit in my stuff around that and he's probably thinking exactly the same he's just trying to you both you both have a kind of I guess natural respect for each other's work again like you were saying with the with the premixes that you get in terms of the dialogue. When we're finally, sometimes I'll tell the director, it depends on his the involvement. You can pretty much tell how involved, I mean, they all like the process more or less, and I'll tell the director, don't show up until, like, if we start Monday, I'll say a Tuesday around 12, 12, 2 o'clock after lunch, come in and we'll have something for you. Some direct some directors like to, to sit at that. You know, I got nothing to do. I'll sit here with you, ask me anything, and I won't make any comments until you ask. So they just sit there while you while you mix, uh, and then you know you might say, it, 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 "Do you want to hear more of this uh, dialogue, or do you want more sound effects?" Oh, I think that'll work, or that loop line's not. You know, so so he'll get, he'll be involved minimally as we ask him questions. Um, so typically it's about 50% there, 50% not. So, but a lot of times they just come in, listen to it, and give you notes, and then we then they leave. We do the notes, they come back, and we play the reel back again, <laughs> and then we take their last final notes. Uh, well, at least it's good that they can't. I mean, I guess they understand as well that you can't be just over the shoulder all the time micromanaging every single decision. I mean, have you had any directors that are very um, like, ooh, I wouldn't... <laughs> ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you find working with uh, different directors? Is there kind of a, <laughs> any kind of tips for, for just de yeah, dealing I mean, with just, someone? Uh, the, you, you've got to be, you know, you're just their extension. I mean, if you, uh, there, are, um, there are directors who micromanage everything and so you just put up with it I mean if you if you resist you know what sounds good and you present and you put together what works for you and you present it to him if they don't like it it's fine I'll just do what you know if they want it on the ceiling that's where they'll get it and you know it's, if it's their project it's their movie you're just trying to I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess it up on purpose for them. But if if they micromanage everything, those are not typical directors. But you do run into those kind of people who just um, think they know everything, and they may or may not. But you, you, in, just by the way they're directing you, you can tell they don't really have a sensibility for the film. Um, and then there are other directors. The, the best directors are the are the ones that are an audience. So they just, wow, that was great. Could you just push a little music there, and then we got a good reel. You know, th th those are fun guys. <laughs> Where they they are an audience, and rather than micromanaging every little detail. Yeah. I guess it's important just to kind of send them away and just convince them that yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be fine. <laughs> it's gonna be fine. Have, have another latte. Just yeah. Just, Fly around the world, or <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! And uh, one of your other uh, Oscar, you you won an Oscar for the uh, for Speed, and that is that's obviously quite a a big, loud uh, film, right? There's there's constantly something on the move, uh, right? Again, it's it's one thing, I guess, having a keeping the dynamics within within a scene where people are going from, let's say, outside driving to then inside. Uh, are you, was it, is it harder to do something where the, the general level of something is, is raised or lowered, let's say? Um, you just work the cuts. I mean, uh, one, one really interesting thing about speed was every time... Um, um, the uh, tornado showed up, or the what do you call it? The, 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 I guess I, um, not, not the tornado, the um, the funnel. What do you call that? Uh, I guess it was a tornado. Every time that showed up, music went away. So you never you, you never were battling a music against sound effects, which was which really helped 
the dynamics of the film. The dialogue was in terrible, terrible shape um, because he had uh, jet engines running in the scene with water pumping through them to give the illusion of this incredible storm. So the dialogue was just useless. It just was totally useless. So I, I had a lot of loops in that film, especially any time there was a, a tornado showing up. <laughs> and so the, the levels on that were, were you know, just in and out, you know, and um, basically all those tornadoes were outside. So <laughs> it wasn't a lot of, if I remember, it wasn't a lot of cutting back and forth. Yeah. And can you just say, I mean, just tell us a, just some tales from Empire Strikes Back, because I'm sure there's loads of fans out there, especially with the the new movies coming out soon. Yeah, Empire Strikes Back was uh, uh, that was with, um, with with Lucas. He was a a gentle soul. I mean, he hardly said anything. He just sat there and and uh, watched this mix. He because he we mixed this in Hollywood, and he was living up you know up north in us near um, San Francisco. So he he came down. He pretty much kind of stayed in the on the stage, and, and we would mix a reel, um, and had very few notes. He was he was really interesting to work with. Those days, mixing was a performance, unlike it is today, because we were on one four-track recorder, okay, left, mm -hmm. center, right, and a surround track, and dialogue, music, and effects all fed that one recorder. Mm. So it was essentially a performance. We would rehearse all day. But actually, sometimes we would, not all day, we'd rehearse, we'd set up in the morning, and we'd rehearse, 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 go to lunch, and, you know, those are the days or working it I, I didn't know who, any of the characters I just didn't know because I wasn't listening to the story I would just I would watch the footage counter and at 350 feet I had a duck 5 DB down on the music because there was dialogue coming in and then at 495 feet after he said let's get out of here and I push another 20 DB to, so it was all footages and, and just word cues so and I had no idea what was going on story wise. I didn't know who anybody was really because I was more concerned about performing my music mix. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until even after the uh, playback, uh, I would listen just to make sure I cleared that. Oh, that was good there. It, you know, it would be three or three playbacks before I would start getting into the story because I, I was more concerned about where I was level wise, so I didn't clobber the dialogue. Because, and the other thing is, uh, if I made a mistake or the dialogue I made a mistake during the pass, oh shoot, we'd have to stop, and then we'd back up, and then we'd we would match input to output, uh, and then we if everybody would kind of like trying to find out where they were at any particular footage. And if we couldn't find a place, we'd say, well, let's try the gunshot. So we would, okay, we'll go in at the gunshot. And I said, well, I can't do that because I'm crossing between the AQ and the BQ, and I'm, I'm actually, you know, so we'd have to find a spot where we could punch in. And so what we do find, once we thought, I think we can get in there, and we'd back up, punch in, and then we'd, we'd all turn and look up because the recordist was up there in a window he he would be listening to the output of the machine, and he would either do this <laughs> or give us a kind of wavy thumb. <laughs> if it was this, we knew we blew it. So now that punch was bad. So th then we'd have to roll back further to find another place where we'd get in. Uh, and you know, so now we're back in say 50, 100 feet from where we were, where we made our mistake. And oh, I got, oh yeah, 350 feet. I gotta come down for. You'd have to remember where you were. There was no automation, nothing. And then when <laughs> when when the film went out for a preview, I remember during. Um, I can remember like on the, the on the Raiders of the Lost Ark, that that whole truck chase. They had they made an edit, 
and the music editor came up to me and said, I couldn't resync the music. You'll have to relay the cue. Oh, <laughs> so now it's shorter. So at my 350 foot mark that I wrote down on the cue sheet was invalid because it didn't. It I couldn't do it. So we'd have to re, we'd have to remake that whole tr trace. You know, a, a, a truck chase cue again. And it was a, a whole different way of working. That's, yeah, it's just so crazy that you're just doing it essentially kind of live, just yeah, <laughs> over yeah. and over again. <laughs> so, you know, and I get, so was there, I mean, because you were rehearsing, 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 that's essentially doing your kind of pre-dubs, as it were, and are you then listening back back to that, or is it just kind of... This there, was nothing to listen, there was nothing to listen back to. So what we would do is we would hit play, and we'd be on input, and then we would go, oh, uh, hang on, we back up. I th and then I'd try to figure out how far down I have, would have to come to clear dialogue. Okay, and I'd write, we'd stop, and I'd write the footage down, and how much I'd put a little pencil mark on the a sketch on on the fader so I knew where I, to come down to. Then we'd back up, and then we'd play again. And, and you know, we just, it was just an input rehearsal for, you know, for hours until we, I think we got it. And that was always fun coming back after lunch. We would say, okay, load the recorder up. And we would just hit it and go pop to pop I one, without stopping. And we go, yeah, it's not bad. You know, so I, was, I could have cleared dialogue a little better there, and the gunshot was a little too. And, and so from there, that, then we would try to get in and punch and make fixes. And <laughs> it was just a, it was laborious, but that, that's the way it was done. Yeah, fantastic. It's almost like getting back to doing like production mixing. It's like now right. you've, you've done it. It's like you've kind of gone back and been able to, well, the, now we've got the production stuff up, let's try and just remix it again. <laughs> That's, yeah, it's fascinating. And so are you finding, uh, obviously, I mean, workflows now, everything's digital, have changed uh, just enormously. Are you finding the. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything you can kind of say on just the the general. How how are you finding um, the maybe less laborious but quick clean digital approach as opposed to the kind of in the room sweating it out? Well, the the it's because of the process is more exacting now. There's the I mean you can just get in there and tweak the EQ and. Mainly, like on dialogue, uh, it, it, there's an enormous amount of EQing in dialogue when you're premixing, and you can just the the exactitude, if that's the correct word, the the, the precision that you can get everything is is um, much greater than it ever was before. Al although it is digital, some people don't like it. It can be a little aggressive, especially the S's. I, I remember, uh, you know, the analog mixes were a little warmer sounding, um, but the the what the cool I mean the cool thing about it is when when the when you come back with the film six three weeks later, everything's there for you. You know, you you, you just get in. There's no trying to match. What did I do here? Oh, was I had ten? You know, you didn't do a lot of um, on the fly EQing in in the days where everybody was in because. If you start doing that, uh, you couldn't. Get, it was impossible to remember what you did. You just couldn't write everything down. There was no memory. It was all up here. And basically, once, once, for example, if I was in music and I had just put a little ten, you know, plus two at ten k all through my music, that's the that's the whole film. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be tweet, you know, at three hundred feet plus five here minus. It would never work. You you just couldn't do it. You can do that now with the with the automation. Yeah, <laughs> so it's much, much more exact. Number, the number of the number of tracks you must have is oh yeah, you were saying before about sixteen tracks. I mean that's sixteen just for the dialogue, and then you're yeah, and, and then uh, effects must be another further sixteen probably, and then music as well. well. On um. Well, not the first day uh, we started Fury Road, the sound effects editors had pre-mixed the sound effects for for uh, the sound the sound mixer. They had 
157 five one pre dubs. Now that's so many pre dubs we couldn't even put it on my if I had no dialogue or music, we couldn't fit it on the console. It was that enormous. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. That is definitely well covered in the five point one spectrum. <laughs> well it took, it took a week. It took a week of just uh, running through and getting um, those 157 five ones down to 38 five ones. So it, it, it was just, it was a laborious mix. Yeah. And how are you finding, I mean, things have obviously changed as well in terms of now even there's Dolby Atmos and all sorts of things like that. Are you mixing to uh, various standards or just one standard or? It's just one standard, to, you know, it's, it's a discrete format. Excuse me. So um, we don't mix through the box or, you know, through DTS or SRD. It's just a discrete, it's a discrete mix. And then once that mix is completed and signed off, then you do the different um, formats. Now, I haven't had the uh, opportunity to work on a, a Atmos, but from listening and talking to my friends, it's typically two weeks additional after the printmaster. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> You've got so much, so many things. And what do you, I mean, have you heard, have you heard Atmos back and things like that? What, do you, what are you thinking in terms of the advances in terms of being able to uh, not just mix the levels, but just to be able to obviously just place things in, in a space? Oh, it's amazing because, I mean, you, you, you walk in the room and you can see the speaker arrays. There's, you know, 18, 19, 20 speakers all over this, the, the side wall. So it, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, like I say, I haven't had the opportunity, but um, films that have things moving in them like helicopters and, you know, whiz-bys with bullets can be very effective. You know, Gravity was one of those uh, Atmos mixes that was very effective. Mm, and then uh, for the, I mean, as as things move more into obviously just more and more effects, more and more different plugins, more and more, uh, it, it's kind of uh, the technology is kind of more taking over the. It's like the art versus the the craft kind of debate again. Uh, I I think I think for for me personally, there's there's so many now different tools and things that you can learn, and whether it be just you learn isotopes or you learn. Uh, um, you know, the, I, isotope is a is really amazing. I, I'm very impressed with it. Uh, I let the editors deal with that. I, I, I'm still I'm a kind of a minimalist. I have basically um, a compressor. I just started using a. I bought my first plugin, <laughs> which is a fat filter plugin. Your first folks. <laughs> yeah, and that and that uh, that deesser works. I'm I'm impressed with the deesser. So basically, um, I use a deesser, uh, a, a seizure box, just to get just to skim at the bottom end, um, and. Uh, I've been using something called Magic Spectrum on occasion, which is a, an ADR. Uh, have you have you heard of Magic Spectrum? No, no. But it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, what it does is, uh, if you have a production line, an ADR line that you want to slip in, and then you go back to production, what you do is you analyze. You you look at the production line through this box, analyze it, and then tell the uh, loop line to to mimic the equalization of it so that you can actually get really, really close so that when you go from the production to the ADR, it sounds like it, it's the, it, the EQ. There's like over 100 EQ points in it. It's, it's very, it can be very effective. Wow. But, um, I, I always prided myself on being able to match loops without that box. With, so as the technology um, increases, I mean, I, I don't like to get lost in the technology so much because there's still an art to it. And I, I so I'm, a, I'm more or less a, a minimalist in terms of a lot of gear. So it's just basically 
compressing, de uh, compressing, deessing, and a little bit of uh, noise reduction. And I do a lot of hand hand deessing. I'll go through and uh, if you're familiar with clip gain in Pro Tools, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go through. Uh, I can see the S's on the waveform, and I shh, so I'll just go through there and highlight the S and pull it down, and it's perfect. <laughs> Takes a little. It's a little laborious, but I like the sound of it. it some some DSers are a little too aggressive for me. That's why I like that Fab filter. So I use a Fab filter plugin just to get just to get a handle on the DSing. And if it's really aggressive, then I'll go in with a clip gain and and pull it down a little further. Amazing. And in terms of uh, you were saying before about again just matching dialogue to the ADR, are you using anything like impulse responses, or are you given any sort of extra? extra tools to be able to do anything with, or is that more a, a dialogue editor's kind of realm? Well, um, they don't give me, they don't do much to the ADR, they just present it to me as is, okay, and then I'll just listen to it. Typically, um, typically production dialogue is not very well recorded, so I try to mimic that by um, high pass, low pass, take a lot of the top end you know, I, sometimes I, I'll go down as far as 12K minus 8. Sometimes I'm down at uh, 8K, just a really nice, not a gentle roll-off. So uh, it doesn't have that really clean sound to it. Uh, so that will get me in the pocket. And then if it's in a room, then I'll, I'll use my lexicon, uh, either a 960 or a 480, to uh, g give me the space I need to, to match the production. So it's uh, it's all on me. I uh, I don't have them. And, and if I if I, lately the last couple of films I've used that uh, plugin called Magic Spectrum. Um, the the editor had it. So a lot of the, sometimes the sound the sound supervisor was yelled to the dialogue editor, put the Magic Spectrum on that. And then okay, so we put it in and it's fine. <laughs> it just was easier for me to do it sometimes for them to do it for me. Fantastic. And for the uh, sound effects supervisor, I, they're sitting in on the mix as well, I assume. Oh, yeah, they're there from the they're, they're there from the get go. They may not be there for dialogue, but they're certainly there for sound effects premixing. Hmm. Yeah, nice. Typically, I'll, typically I'll have just if I, if I'm doing dialogue pre pre dubs premixing, it'll be me and the dialogue editor, and because it's like. Uh, it's like watching paint dry. So there's not too much, there's not a lot of interest. <laughs> Very nice. Special, unique club. That's good. That's fantastic. I'm trying to think of any ways that uh, I could get some sort of ideas in terms of the production tracks. How generally the the problems that you're you're dealing with uh, in terms of how they've act how they actually sound? Um, typically, I'll, um, I, not always, but um, it's like the production mixer sometimes gets caught. You know, uh, and, and I'm only surmising this because I'm, I've never been in production, so I don't know, but it, uh, I'm only assuming that when the scene is being rehearsed and everybody is just kind of, yeah, okay, I'll be there in a minute, hang on a second, or whatever the actors are saying, and then they say, okay, take one. All of a sudden, they just jump up on the dialogue, and it sounds like the production maker is caught off guard, and he quickly pots down. So I'll get these levels, you know, as the, <laughs> these square off uh, levels on the, from, you know, from a very loud dialogue all of a sudden down to a smaller level. And uh, that used to catch me off guard all the time before I had Pro Tools because I had to manually chase it, and sometimes I couldn't. It was just a pain. And now with with Pro Tools, I can, I can actually. The, 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 sometimes the dialogue editor has assisted me a little bit beforehand, and I can still hear it. And then I'll do, I'll do some more work on it just so that uh, the dialogue sounds level and smooth. Um, and then you know, there's the use of body mics, which are lavaliers. They're just, you know, a problem, especially if they're wearing. Um, um, like the, the silk or you know the really noisy fabrics. So the, <laughs> every time they move, you hear this. Shh, and that's it. Just drives you crazy. <laughs> so I prefer I prefer overhead mics. 
But sometimes, I mean, I, there was some films that when I listened to the overhead, uh, they actually filmed the you know particular. I can't think of the name of the movie, but all you heard was the freeway, freeway, freeway roar. So I elected to go with the dial with the body mics to, to clean it up a little bit, and then uh, you know, so now you get this chesty dialogue sound, and every everybody sounds the same in terms of their spatial. In, in the scene, and it's difficult to, to add uh, space with a chest mic. Yeah. Those are the problems I sort of run into. Yeah. Well, it's always really interesting when I do, I do kind of a bit of uh, kind of side lecturing just on like one day workshops for uh, production sound mixing, and always it's like, so when you rehearse, basically ignore <laughs> the level that the <laughs> actor is doing. It's just your, your rehearsal is just for where they're going and what they're saying. What yes, level they're in. The light comes on, it's like 5 dB, 6 dB louder. <laughs> yeah. It's mad. But yeah, that's really interesting thinking about it, uh, about the radio mic thing. I mean, obviously there's always the problem with like polyester or like wool or anything where it's the furrier it is, the, the worse it is. Yeah, um, but the um, yeah the the space issue because I guess when I when I've been thinking about um, using using radio mics and things, especially if it's like a louder, uh, say say you're by a motorway or something like that, and you need to have that proximity to be able to get any sort of decent level um, right. or at least consistency throughout throughout a performance, it's interesting to then take into account that that consistency actually just makes things quite flat. Right. So I mean, I've I, yeah. I've had, I've I, you know, I've had uh, tracks delivered to me where I've had three tracks for each each character, the body mic, the overhead, and a combo track. You know, and so now I've got to go through and pick one. And I can remember doing a film where I picked the wrong tracks because when the director came in, he went, "Is that is that the right? Are you?" Because he remembers. You know the, the the sound of the room bigger than than what I'm using because I thought the one mic was too noisy, so I went with the other mic. So that goes that goes back to the fact that I like to have the director come in and listen to the tracks and oh no, that's not the right. I want the other mic because we'll run into that. And so you know you don't want to waste time on the final trying to do everything on the on the fly. So I. Uh, um, I, so getting three mics is it can be laborious. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to see that you haven't lost the laborious aspect of you <laughs> of your mixing. <laughs> it keeps you on your toes, I guess. Yeah, yeah the does. concentration. Um, there's uh, a question come in just about uh, the more mixing and processing you do for. Uh, uh, wait, how much more mixing or processing? Do you do from the theatrical mix when it goes down to Blu-ray or near field mix and also stereo mix? Yeah, a lot of times that uh, if I'm if I have the time, I'll do a, what we call the near field mix. And what we do for a near field mix is take it off the main speakers and put them on. A, we have smaller speakers like a TV. Sometimes I'll even have a TV with TV speakers and we'll turn the volume down to where you could actually listen to the film and be on the telephone at the same time so you could hear the telephone. Not that I'm on the telephone, but that's the we're mixing at a significantly lower level and typically what we're doing is just chasing dialogue. So I'll just make sure you can hear the dialogue and, and that's sometimes I'll take the the le the, the, the the music left and right, and just shaded a dB and a half. Same thing with sound effects, um, um, pre-dubs, just so that the dialogue is much more clear, and you don't have to be chasing uh, the dialogue with your remote control when you're watching the movie at home. Mm. So there's not a, a, a lot of processing. It's typically just chasing levels at a, at, uh, for dialogue. Yeah, because there's always there's always the com the complaint uh, from the the music's too loud or you can't hear this that and exactly. the other. I guess it's but you you must always, I mean, when you're you have your one TV set, but now there's there's so many TV sets from your your 4K masters surround <laughs> some, like right. DIY custom speaker array to to just 
a kind of yeah one mono speaker straight in the center. So, uh, is yeah, there so any? We, we do we do a we do a, a five a five one um, TV mix at, at a low level. So I'll, I'll have a left center right and a split surrounds, and so we will. I'll do a little a, a slight compression on the music on the music stem and the effect stem. There'll be a slight compression, and then uh, a little comp slight a, a different compression setting on the dialogue, and just a little bump up, up on the dialogue so that you can. Hear. And then we'll just go through it. And if if, if um, at that lower level, if you can't hear the dialogue, I'll back up and just tweak it a little bit. You know, just just so that you're not you're sitting there comfortably hearing everything and that nothing's being clobbered dialogue wise. And when you're so you're doing a five point one, but then people that for instance, don't have 5.1, is it, it's only selecting the first three channels, for instance, it's not then combining it, combining the surround into, like, center, left, and right again, is it? Actually, that that one pass can, can all, not only we, in, in that one pass, we can only monitor one format or the other, so uh, we, we have the 5.1 and the, and the stereo mix going simultaneously. Okay, so um, as we're mixing, uh, I can actually hit a button and listen to the two track or the five one two track five one two track five one. Okay, that's sounded okay, and then we just can. Uh, so I don't. By the time we get to this stage mm -hmm. of the mix, uh, they just they just they're waiting for the stuff. So it <laughs> it would be nice if I could just do a pass. Go back and play it back. Sometimes they do, we do that. We'll, we'll make a five-one playback and a two-track playback. But most of the time, it's just hit the record, go, and you're done. When you hit the pop, I might do a little spot check and then it just ship it out. Fair and enough. if if there's a problem, um, I'll hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> Send to PO box. <laughs> right. No, they, they, they keep, there's another QC. Somewhere else, they're doing some QC checks, and they'll they'll say, "Oh, there was a hole here," or "I um, is this what you wanted?" And I'll come back and over, I'll go over there and listen. Yeah, that's what we wanted. Fine, that's the director's choice. So they don't know a lot of times what what what's what's supposed to be because they're not they haven't been there on the mix, so they might question levels based on what they think they should hear, but not knowing what the director wanted. It sounds really well, interesting for a, a quality control position to not know <laughs> what what kind of quality you're you're managing. Right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> really um, so I mean, that's kind of I, we've been talking for about an hour, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. If it's just kind of a shout out to anyone who's uh, watching, we have six viewers, which is I think pretty impressive for. My uh, 5 a.m. start. Uh, <laughs> so if any of you guys have uh, more questions, and I'll take into account the the kind of one minute delay. So when I suddenly decide to sign off, you're all coming in a minute later, going, "Wait, wait." wait. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, but it's it's been a fascinating fascinating chat, and it's it, it's really good just to again the whole point of these talks is just to take into, I mean. For me, if if no one else, just uh, the full spectrum of of how things are, are constantly translating throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. It's just like they say that you kind of write one film, then you edit one film, then you uh, you shoot one film. It's just seeing how you how you maintain those sort of sound standards all the way through, and how obviously once we get to the final final mixing stage, how that's kind of finessed or completely changed or or used in a, in a completely yeah interesting way. Um, do you have any other um, just interesting, unusual stories from any of your hundreds of films that you've done? <laughs> I'll well, try. You know, and... But back in the day when we were doing Mag, you know, uh, by the time that print, by the time we print mastered, we were almost seven generations down. So there was a generation, you know, you picked up hits every time you, 
there was a premix, there was the final, there was the print master. So you 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 really picked up a lot of hiss. Um, so the, the, uh, as opposed to today, man, you can have hundreds of tracks. And this, the noise floor is just you know negligible. In terms of stories, um, can't think of anything at the moment. Um, I'm sure that once we hang up, I'll, oh, I should have told them this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it will always be the case. We'll try and <laughs> maybe get, get you back at some some point in the future as well. Okay. The um, is there a kind of uh, a certain genre or a certain type of uh, music, for instance, that you prefer, or you kind of have your yeah, just your own personal preference? I mean, uh, it. it it's interesting how it used to come in blocks. I, I did a lot of musicals, and that was really fun. I, I did the 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 the, the, uh, the Who's the Kids Are All Right. I don't know if it's with uh, that was an interesting film. It was about the Who and their concert footage. Stop making sense. Um, hair. Um, the last waltz. Now uh, that that's an interesting story. I don't know if you saw the last waltz. It's Bob Dylan's backup band with Robbie Robertson. That was uh, the longest mix that ever worked on. It was uh, six months and seven days a week, actually seven nights a week, of um, pre-mixing. Finally, and it was it's out on DVD, but it was um, it was a film about uh, the band. Which was Bob Dylan's backup band. They were they were doing a Thanksgiving concert. It was also a one night shoot, eleven cameras, and um, they they uh, they the the band wasn't really into filmmaking. So, for example, um, uh, Rick Danko, the bass player, when they took their tape, when they it, it was shot on film, but they recorded on twenty four track machine, and they took their they took their tape to their studio and over and Rick said, "My bass play, I want to overdub all my bass parts." And so he would he overdub everything without regard to sync. Okay, <laughs> so and this was pre pre automation time. So when I was I was pre dubbing, I, I think I spent two months working from the 24 track and pre mixing down to a 16 track. And so um, I would do one track at a time. And so every time Rick Danko was on screen playing his bass and you could see him, I used the production bass. And as soon as the camera panned off, I would have to switch to the overdub bass. And so that 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 would that took just forever, you know. So it was a that was an interesting mix. And that I had uh, six months on that film. I had three days off: Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. We worked from. Uh, from uh, I can't November, December, November, December, January, February, March, April. Yeah, from November to to May. Wow, that is a long winter. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The, yeah, that's wow, that's crazy. And how was the going through? Were you doing each? I mean, yeah, no wonder it took you so long. Just being able to go through and do each. Instrument, I guess, was it down to that that much detail? Yeah, because everything was, you know, uh, 24 tracks. They had, uh, five, I'm trying to remember, probably five tracks of drums, plus Levon Helm's vocal, plus all the other vocals. Um, and each each uh, performer came on, Neil Young and Bob. You know, uh, if you've ever seen the film, it's really interesting. When Neil Young showed up on the screen, this is. Um, and I only know this because I did a Neil Young film with him called Russ Never Sleeps. Okay, so, so I'm going to back up. When Neil Young came on, he said um, he started singing a song called Helpless. So now you've got, and as he came on the stage, you, you don't see this because I, Neil told me, as he was walking on the stage, he's walking by the people in the back by the curtain, and they're all shoveling cocaine up his nose, okay? So... When he shows up on screen and starts singing, we, you've got a full full frame face, uh, you know, on a on a huge screen with a huge white cocaine things hanging on his nose. 
They they rotoscoped it out. It was it was very primitive. But uh, I asked him about that later when I when I mixed him up up six or seven months later. I did his film called Russ Never Sleeps, and I asked him about that co that cocaine incident, and he told me yes. Yeah, he had his guitar in his hand, and he was walking out. People were just shoveling cocaine up his nose. <laughs> you a little, little pick-me-up, eh? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, we've just got um, a few more last questions that have... have okay. Um, it's just... Uh, two of them are just more about the... I mean, we've, we've touched on, like, the sound designer sound editor and re-recording mixer all together. Um, but uh, what do you think of um, supervising sound editors that, what do you think of people that are doing kind of the multiple roles? Is there any, um, yeah, just uh, people doing, for instance, the sound design, the supervising sound editor, and the re-recording mixing? I mean, it's just that it's, it's that's the the nature of the business has changed. It's the it isn't like it used to be. Um, so you have guys who like to do both. I, I, I you know, it, it does impact your work a little bit. Um, where a guy will do all the editing and then comes in and mixes. Um, and, and I'm a, I'm the of the ilk that you can do one thing good, but not two things good so you know you either mix or you edit and um, I don't pref I, I can do minimal editing I do that when I need to but I'm nothing I'm not an editor and um, I, I've heard editors who do their own editing and mixing um, and I don't mean this as a rub but a, a, a lot of the mixes I, I'm a little critical because everything plays it in one dimension because they want to hear everything so you don't get you don't get depth you know, it's not always that the case, but um, it, it it does impact. It, it has impacted the the, the way um, I get films now. A lot of times, um, I'm not as busy as I used to be because you know, I, look, I can uh, an editor will say, look, I, I have my rig at home. Um, I'll do it for 200 an hour, mix it, and then we'll just go to the stage and do the final. And so you know, it it, it does impact your your work. And you know this is the way it is. Uh, one of my editor friends was telling me. He says, you know, I see one guy doing everything one day, so <laughs> he's going to be cutting it, color correcting it, editing, mixing. You know, it's it's um, it does impact the way the films are mixed and it cut. You know, um, I'm I'm not complaining because um, I'm probably on the on the fade in terms of my career. <laughs> Well, it's been a, <laughs> you've already got so many, yeah, just the, the number of nominations and everything else like that. But it's, I, I just personally reflecting on just production sound in general, it's always the way that the 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 camera guys now can rock up with the, the cheaper and cheaper stuff. And it um, they, they say, right, well, I, I can edit this as well. and Or I, I've got a friend who can do a bit of the color grading. And it's all, yeah, it's all kind of, the the work is is increasing in a way, and yet the the number of people to do it is decreasing, and it's all becoming very kind of centric. Yeah, and it's driving wages down. You know, it's not like it's it's not like it used to be. Um, and then and then a lot of the new directors they don't. You know, when you work with a guy like Stallone, he's he 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 doesn't want to work in your in your garage when you're mixing a film. You know, he he wants. So, you know, those guys want to be in a in a facility where they're they're catered to. Uh, so it's so it's a, it's a different dynamic. Uh, um, you know, you just got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I it's a whole uh, another complete talk about the yeah the industry in general. Uh, it's how do you find? I mean, just being able to because. For instance, I mean, taking kind of the facility aspect out, uh, like me personally, it's it's sometimes hard for to be able to justify um, to a person, for instance, that doesn't necessarily uh, know the difference between one sound mixer or another, apart from their gear, how you how you establish any sort of kind of wage or anything else like that. Uh, I don't know if 
if you have any kind of thoughts on that for people kind of starting out, if they should just kind of pick an amount and just be able to go with it, or there's yeah, for instance, a lot of a lot of um, films uh, they end up being this kind of uh, oh well, how much how much can you do? I just want kind of one number. I just kind of want one figure, and then uh -huh. this is when they start changing the edit, and it's like, oh, I've just changed one shot, um, and it happens to be the whole film. <laughs> yeah, well, you, I mean, I, I, I know guys who are independent, you know, and, and, and in terms of establishing uh, some sort of a, a, a wage, you can use the union... The, the union established rate for a mixer, you know, and, and go from there. Um, and then some some guys will work, you know, you know they'll set an amount to do, um, you know, $1,500 a reel uh, and and without changes. And, you know, you, you got to, you've got to, Set it up so if they if they start changing everything on you that every time you make a change it's going to cost you money because otherwise you're just doing it for nothing. It's just a it's a pain and so you got, you got to especially the independent. That's very difficult. I I'm, I've never been on the independent side of things. I've always been in them, you know, at Universal or at Fox or Sony or Warner Brothers where everything is uh, expensive, but Expensive. It's not like it used to be. I mean, the book rate over at Paramount Studios, for example, the book rate is, I think, is a sixteen hundred an hour. Nobody pays that, but that's what the established book rate is. And I've, you know, I've done films over at Sony where the rates for the room is four hundred an hour. So it just all depends on what's going on. If, if nothing's happening, uh, you can get a, a room pretty cheap. You know, it depends on the, and then that, that also depends on who you're going to get to mix. And if they don't, if they don't care who they've got, they can get a guy for, you know, seventy-five, hundred bucks an hour plus the room. Um, I guess it's yeah, it's just a, a never-ending kind of question. But it's yeah, it's really useful to get your your kind of insights on it because again, it's uh -huh. just for for sound mixers personally. They, I mean, we uh, there's kind of there's Facebook groups and there's people are actually like. Coming together in a way, and the the topic is kind of getting a bit more open as opposed to being like, well, that guy is that guy's undercutting, so I better I better just in case anyone else is out there doing anything. I think <laughs> hopefully we're seeing a kind of definitely I think I've seen a sort of tide in terms of the conversation in terms of just adding more kind of uh, value and doing it kind of in that way rather than mm -hmm. just kind of undercutting and then. You end up, I don't know. You have to do like two feature films a month or something to be able to cover your rent or anything. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. No, it's 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 tough. It... Yeah, it's tricky. Um, and there's uh, kind of the final thing, which was just touching on. Um, you said as well that you're doing. Uh, I mean, not much, not much um, editing, obviously, because we've got like uh, obviously your dialogue edits and everything else like that. But are you on the day apart from? Uh, Choosing alternates, are you um, sort of? You're only. It's about kind of the adding, the changing, or removing of kind of uh, dialogue or music. And are you, especially with the music, it'd be quite interesting to find out. Um, are you asking for any sort of changes in that music, or is it again just it's left to the director's kind of realm, and you're just going to kind of just go with it? Music is, you know, uh, the music editors are very possessive of their tracks, okay? So I usually don't mess with their tracks because um, that's a whole different discipline in terms of the way they've edited things down. And so I'll just, I take their stuff, Unity, and, you know, if it's whatever that, whatever that stuff comes out on the Pro Tools, I set up on my console. Um, I'm still a... a a lot of my mixes are what I call on a steel board, not, and I mean when I mean a steel board, it's a you know a, it's a a real desk. It's not a Pro Tools or an Icon thing, although I am fed Icon material or Pro Tool material to the desk, and I've been working lately on a DFC console, so that's a what I call a steel board. Um, 
So I, whatever I get from a music a music editor, I, I just pretty much Unity. I don't do any EQ. I just because I know each EQ they've worked on it for 11 hours a piece. So I'm not gonna sit there and say, hey, Lynn, I'll fix this because I know they've gone through it. I just I, I know where it's come from. So I just set it up at Unity and just try to work around effects and dialogue with it so that it it plays in a way that you don't feel the pulls and pushes in underneath and above dialogue. Um, occasionally I'll get a, a, a music editor who'll say, it sounds a little dull, can you just brighten it up? And I'll just, you know, notch a couple dB at 10 just to give it a little more, just to open it up a little bit. Uh, I don't use any compression on it. Um, it's just pretty much the way they deliver it. Um, that's probably, I, I, and the only thing I ask for that, I, I have a, a monitor that I can see. I don't have any cue sheets anymore. You don't get any paper cue sheets. My, my cue sheets are actually a monitor, so I can see the Pro Tool waveforms. And so I can, as I'm mixing dialogue, I'm looking to my left and I look at another monitor and I can see here comes the here comes the music and I can kind of chase some of the the dynamics by watching the uh, m the monitor and listening to what the dialogue's doing. Cool. Well, that's that's all the questions we kind of have. Um, okay. So yeah, that's kind of it for now, really. So just to say. Uh, just thank you to everyone out there who's been watching. We still have five or six hardcore viewers that have been uh, watching for the last, uh, I think we're up to like an hour and hour and a half, which is yes, yeah, which is uh, phenomenal. So anyone who's there who hasn't subscribed already, uh, please do. And this talk will be available as kind of a video in probably a couple of hours' time. Um, so I, all that's kind of left to say is just. Uh, Thank you, Steve. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for... It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No, no problem at all. It's been uh, a, yeah, a fascinating chat, and we'll have a little uh, further talk off air. But I'll I'll just say goodbye, and then I'll let you have kind of final words and say goodbye as well. Okay. Yeah. Like I say, thank you so much for uh, for for letting me speak. It's always fun to talk about it, uh, and I'm, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Fantastic. And we'll catch you guys later. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>